Father, as we sing this next song, God, let it be a cry from our hearts. Let it be a plea to you. God, as we, as we go through this series on standing firm, that we won't be shaken, Father, that, I pray, that, that we would be the generation that people look at and say, that generation has a God, that generation has the God. There's something different. There's something unexpected out of this generation. They seek something different. They don't seek what everybody else seeks, Father. And I pray that from the depths of my soul that that would be all of us. As we sing this, Father, let us sing it to you from our hearts. Thank you. 
God of Jacob. Let's pray together. God, you know, those words are words we love to sing and long to actually live out, Lord. Uh, so help us in the day to day. Lord, help us when we leave this place to be reminded of you. And Lord, let your spirit live in and through us. And God, produce in our lives the character and godliness that we can't do on our own. That we absolutely need from you to do in and through us, Lord. So that we might be that generation that others can look to and see how you're moving so uniquely and so incredibly through. Lord, use us to be world changers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry about that. Uh, you may be seated right where you are. You know, Labor Day weekend is always a fun weekend. First of all, I want to say thank you for everyone who's here today helping out. I want to say thank you to especially some very unique people. They are the in-the-trenches people for me, and uh, they are our setup team. Every Sunday morning, they get here early. They sacrifice sleep and sometimes breakfast to put this church together, and so uh, I would love to just have us give them a huge round of applause and say thank you for all their hard work. We've got a father-in-law and a son. Uh, they are both involved with a wedding today, and so they're doing a renewal of vows, and they even helped set up today, and the, the wedding's at five, so thank you, Ron and Tyler. We're so excited. Appreciate all you guys' hard work, but for everybody else that helps us, we could not do it without you guys as well. You know, Anchor Church is a young and growing church. It was so fun to hear the clamor in the background last week of people putting out extra chairs. And God is growing this church. And it's my prayer that as God grows our church numerically, that he continues to grow the individuals within the church spiritually. That we could keep up with what God's doing. That we could each find ourselves submitting ourselves to God and allowing him to change us and transform us. That's our vision here. We want to see lives transformed by Jesus for Jesus. Uh, we're a church that has the motto that we want to be known more for what we do than what we're against. To give you an update, we have been praying for Emily. She's a four-year-old who has cancer. Her family, about a year ago, used to attend Anchor Church. And we are purchasing t-shirts on her behalf. Many of you ask, how can I help? How can I participate? What could I do to help that family? Well, if you feel led by God, you can buy a shirt for $20, and that will go to help fund her uh, recovery and some of the medical bills and expenses that the family is incurring. Uh, we are buying 100 t-shirts for the kids and the adults here at Anchor Church. And in a couple weeks when they come in, we're going to put them all on. we got sizes for all of you guys, and we're going to pray for Emily, and we're going to take a picture and send our support and love to her. Uh, something happened this uh, week as well. We, we've got our drummer. She, this morning, at about 6 o'clock, sent a message to our worship leader, and She's sick. She's got the stomach bug. And I just met and saw a good friend that we haven't seen in a couple weeks. And we found out that she was in an accident as well. A drunk driver had hit her. And so I'd like for us as a church to take time to pray for those three girls, those three women, uh, that we could lift them up and pray for them. And so uh, why don't you right now on your own to just bow your heads where you are, kind of get quiet before God. If, uh, if you're new to this whole church thing, just enjoy this time of silence for yourself. Uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we invite you to support uh, with silence. But uh, those who have a relationship with God and want to connect to God right now and pray to him, well, we want to pray for these three girls. We want to pray for Emily who has cancer. This week's been hard. She was able to go to school, uh, but she was also facing really painful recovery times uh, through chemo and things like that. And so pray for her and pray for her family as she's going through that. That's got to be the most uh, difficult thing for a mom and dad to watch. And let's pray for Gloria. Pray for uh, recovery as she was hit uh, with an accident from a, a drunk driver. That she could have a full and speedy recovery. That she could be comforted and that the pain would subside. Uh, and we also want to lift up the third person in prayer this morning. So we invite you guys to pray right now for those three women. We pray for Emily. Pray for Gloria. And uh, to pray. Uh, I'm sorry. I just went blank here. Mariana. Right. Mariana, our sick drummer. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, so let's pray. Take a time on your own and I'll close this.
God, we don't have any perfect people here today, Lord. And it's so humbling to come on behalf of these three ladies, Lord, who are sick, facing illness, who have cancer, uh, who are recovering from a car accident, Lord. And uh, We're so glad that we are in their lives. And, Lord, we want to support them. We want to rally behind them. We want to lift them up in prayer. We want to call upon the great miracle worker, the one who can bring healing, the one who has set the stars in the sky, the one who created the earth and all that is in it, the one who knows our bodies better than anyone else. Lord, we call upon you, the great physician, to bring healing. Lord, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to this book. It's the book of First Peter. It's in the New Testament. And if you don't have a Bible, we've got several Bibles in the back that we'd love to give you as our gift. Uh, there's a table of contents in the front, and you can find out where 1 Peter is on what page number. And we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're in two parts of a larger series. We're looking at relationships these two weeks. Last week, we looked at what God expects from a wife and what we should look for in a relationship from a female. And this week, we're going to look at it from the perspective of what God expects and longs for for a male. In Scripture, God always addresses both parts. He doesn't leave one hanging. And we spent a lot of time last week, six verses on the female side. And the seventh verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 is really where it opens up. Okay, men, it's time to, to listen up. Where do we begin? You know, if I was to ask the men in this audience and men all over the globe how confident they felt in leading their families spiritually, I'm certain that many would respond with a lack of unclarity. That they would not feel confident. That many, in fact, would say, you know, I'm, I want to be a good man. I want to be an honest man. I want to be a man of integrity. I want to be a man that my spouse or future spouse and children and future children can look up to and follow. But I need some handles. I really don't know where to start. And a recent survey was done on people in churches and it found that women, females, are 59% more likely to be spiritual in the household. In fact, they're 39% more likely to go to church. And for females, oftentimes in our culture, it can almost come more naturally to be spiritual. Oftentimes, men, they don't want to talk about feelings. They don't want to express feelings. And sometimes you show up at church and you see that, man, all they're talking about is feelings right now. And so women at times who are more open, more confident in discussing their feelings, they can express themselves through that manner spiritually and have really found that God is something that fills a huge need in their life where men oftentimes don't even acknowledge or recognize the need for God to be in their lives. Well, I'm here today to tell you that whether you're a man or a woman, whether you express feelings or not, we all need God. We need God if we're single. We need God if we're married. We need God if we have children or if we don't have children at all. We need God to get us through the day today, the moment by moment, and our lives. My wife and I were sitting down not too long ago, and we discussed that we wanted to create a vision for our family. You know, how could we envision our family? What would that look like if our kids were to graduate high school or college and look back on their childhood and say, what was my family about? What would they say? Would they say, oh, I don't really know what my family was about. I, I think I can kind of figure it out. God was important. We went to church from time to time. and Work was important. I, I saw a good work ethic. Uh, you know, but I'm not really sure what my parents were aiming towards. And so my wife and I said, we want to be absolutely certain that when our kids leave the nest one day, that they will have an understanding and know what the vision of our family is. That what the God-given vision for our family is. You know, it's something that we long for. We want to keep our eyes fixed on the horizon. You know, oftentimes in life, the details of life can distract us. We can end up looking at where our feet are stepping. Each little step. 
And it's just like a farmer who sets out to plow. And when he grabs a hold of that plow, if he's looking at his feet to try and draw that straight line, he's going to zigzag and get off course. But if he's got his eyes maybe on a tree in the distance as the focal point, and he's pressing forward towards that step by step, he, he will have that straight line. Well, that's the desire for our family. I believe that God has given us a God-given vision to serve him wholeheartedly. To love him joyfully and to laugh together. God has given us a vision for how our family should operate. God has given us a vision for when we get down the road and our kids look back and reflect, that they're able to say, yeah, our family was dedicated to serving God, loving those around them, and having fun together. I mean, that's our desire. We want to see that happen. So that's our focal point, our horizon. And men, many of us in here, we don't have that horizon yet established. We've never taken the time to ask God, God, what is it that you want from me? What is it that you want from me and my family? How are you wanting to lead my family? Where do you want to direct me? How should I be spending my time, my talents, my treasure? What should all of my energies be being put towards? Many of us have never taken the time to ask God to do that. And so when we come to a passage of scripture like this, we're a whole lot more like the world for relationships. We kind of approach it the same way they do. We kind of fall into the same ruts. I was at Dunkin' Donuts this last week. I kind of have gotten a Dunkin' Donut fixation going on right now. And uh, I've been going there a bunch with my family. And I've been going there sometimes to write sermons. And I was hanging out there drinking some coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. And there's like this elderly group of retirees. It's awesome. They come and they get their coffee and they hang out for about two hours and they make fun of everyone that comes in. They make fun of everything in life and they make fun of each other. And it's all in good hearted, you know, poking, you know, uh, fun. It's great. And I was sitting next to them and listening in to a conversation and, and they're talking about their relationships. And one guy is just getting drilled by the group. They were really reading him this week, making fun of him, taking him to the task. And he was saying, okay, I, I, if, I, if I was going to get this, I could have just stayed at home, right? And he was implying that his relationship with his wife of many, many years was a whole lot worse than what was going on at the table. And one of the ladies turned and looked at me and she said, are you taking notes, Sonny? Because I had my computer. And I, I said, ma'am, I'm writing a whole book right now. <laughs> um, they had so many insights to life, and they were just really funny people. And I came back the next week, and they were kind of going through the same conversation, the same ritual, the same routine of bashing each other and then bashing their spouses at home. And I was thinking, gosh, I don't want my life to end up like that. I don't want my marriage to end up like that. I, I don't want to wander and drift and then somehow I'm in a position where I'm distant from my spouse and my family and honestly strangers that really don't care about me the way that my family does as I'm spending time with them making fun of the ones I really should be spending time with and loving. Now it's like a family is celebrating their 25th anniversary and the wife said, well, what do you think we're going to do for our anniversary? And the farmer said, you know what? I'll go out and I will kill a chicken for us, and we can celebrate that way. And the wife said, well, don't punish the chicken for the last 25 years, you know. And, and some of us, we just approach things that way. Where we're thinking, gosh, this marriage is something I'd rather get out of than invest in. Relationships, future weddings. I'm not interested in any of that because I hear the stories. I see the lives. I see the disgruntled ideas that are surrounded by surrounding marriages. And so what does God have to say to help direct us? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says this. It says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I like the way that the New Living Translation puts the first part of this passage of Scripture. It says, in the same way. So what's the likewise? What's the in the same way? 
You know, last week we talked a lot about the female perspective, about honoring and serving her husband, about submitting to him and having a respect for him. Well, the likewise here links the first six verses. Let's look at those again together. If you're wondering where to begin, how to create that vision for your life, it starts with submission to God and submission to each other. Verse 1, chapter 3 says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry and clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. That's the likewise. You're thinking, good, well, I'm glad Peter's telling me, likewise, don't adorn my hair with braiding and put on fine jewelry and clothing. Like, I'm good. I got that part covered. Uh, but what God is painting a picture here is this picture of not focusing on the outside, but the inside, the character as opposed to the clothing. So for men, God is telling you as well, you've got to work just as hard on submitting yourself to God, on spending time in his word, on developing your character as you could even think about getting ready in the morning. You know, guys, we get ready a whole lot faster than girls. I've got four ladies in my house. I love it, okay? I enjoy four ladies in my house. My wife is the fastest of getting ready out of all four of the ladies. I've got to be honest with you. Uh, but I will tell you, I beat her every single time. Men, we don't take nearly as much time. But let's just say we spend 30 minutes brushing our teeth, getting ready, showering, combing our hair. That's really quick for me right there. It goes smooth. 30 minutes getting ready for the day, to present ourselves to the world we step out into. Do some of us spend 30 minutes a day preparing our hearts for the day that we're going to encounter, preparing our minds, preparing our lives for the spiritual battle that we're going to face? Do we spend sufficient amount of time reading and studying God's Word on our own apart from coming to church? Do we spend time praying, thinking about the loved ones around us, thinking about those who are lost and far from God and asking God to give us an opportunity to maybe share Christ with them or asking God to bring healing to those that we are close to. Do we spend the same amount of time spending our, our, our efforts towards developing our character, our Christian character, as we do the outside? You know, God, through Peter, the author of 1 Peter, is saying, men, likewise, spend the same amount of time on your character. You know, some of you guys read those verses and you thought about that word submit and you immediately thought, wow, you know, that's really hard to hear again, even a second week in a row for females that, that they're to submit to their husbands. You know, scripture is amazing. It calls women to submit or I like the word respect to honor. It calls them to do that. But you know what it never demands men to do in scripture? It never demands men to be dominant. It never demands men to command submission from their homes. No. In fact, the scripture tells the men that they likewise are to submit to their spouse. That they are to serve their spouse. I, I like the way Paul writes it in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 gives us a broader view of this one verse here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you wonder, why is there only one verse in 1 Peter chapter 3 for the men and six for the women? Well, it's two contextually different issues. One is talking about the women who are following a husband who doesn't believe in Jesus, an unbelieving spouse, and how they're to navigate that as a woman of character, of Christian character. And so when it switches to verse 7, it's now talking to the men on how to lead their family. But Ephesians 5 really opens it up for me. If you've got your Bibles, flip over there. It's also going to be on the screen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Paul is beginning this conversation about submission. In the home, submission needs to be as follows. One, each person to God. He's created that order, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we submit our lives to God. That husbands get that honor of being called by God to lead their families, that wives to submit to their husbands. But men, you don't get to get out of this. There needs to be mutual submission as well. Verse 21 starts that way, saying, submitting to one another. That we submit to each other. We submit to our bride. We submit to the fellow believers in the community of Christ, the church, out of reverence to God. This is saying, at times, we're going to put the preference and needs of others above our very own. Verse 25, in fact, calls men to do that. To men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. Husbands, men, future husbands, you want to know how to have a vision for your life in your marriage or your future marriage? It starts right here. By practicing the role of sacrifice. Young men who are trying to date girls, they always crack me up. Because sometimes girls, they just want the bad boy. You know, it took my wife and I many years for me to win her over. About a decade. We knew each other in the eighth grade. And in high school, she knew me. I was a follower of Jesus, and I was a pretty, pretty good guy. But she wanted a bad boy. <laughs> I weighed about 115 pounds. She wanted a man with biceps that weighed 115 pounds. <laughs> There's this attraction that girls have towards the bad boy. But it's the bad boy that always leaves them high and dry. It's the bad boy that always uses and abuses. It's the bad boy that always makes it about themselves. Girls, I think you need to be looking for a man that is seeking after God. One who's already practicing submission to God and sacrifice for others. You want to find a husband in the future. That is one who does good for others. Who puts his needs aside. And these young guys are going after girls who make it all about themselves. And they want all the attention. And they're playing. They don't have any goals. They don't have any vision for their life. Those aren't the guys that you'd be looking for. Men, those aren't the guys that you should be. You know, I told you last week what first attracted me to my wife. She was beautiful and she loved God. That was it for me. She was beautiful and she loved God. Well, what attracted her to me, I asked her. And she said, well, you had a goal. You wanted to go somewhere with your life, even at a young age. And you're pressing towards that goal. That didn't make me happy. I was looking for like, man, you were smoking hot and funny and I liked you. But she's like... No, you had a job. <laughs> Men, responsibility. With sacrifice comes responsibility. God calls us to be men who submit ourselves to him and sacrifice for those around us. It's this principle of love and respect. The greatest way man can show love is by pursuing his bride and sacrificing for her. Giving up everything for her. And the greatest way that a wife can show love is by showing that honor and that respect that she supports her husband in the vision that God has given that family. And that she'll follow his lead towards that vision, that God-given vision. That's how the cycle should work. But when it is stuck, when it's broken, the wife maybe doesn't feel loved and pursued. She's not going to show respect and honor, so he furthers the distance by separating himself, involving himself in different sports or video games or music or his job or friends and never takes the time to sacrifice for a spouse to start that cycle over. Men, it's up to you. 
Here's another handle. You've got to start the cycle over. You've got to show that love and pursue your bride. So there's the likewise. Verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. What the scripture is telling us here is you've got to get to know your bride. That's a big challenge, man. Getting to know a female. Getting to understand the female. Getting into the mind of a female. Anticipating the needs, the wants, and desires of a female. My wife has described to me that her brain is like spaghetti. It's all intertwined. Everything is connected. When she's talking about oranges, what she's really talking about is something that happened at work. And I'm trying to figure out the links, the spaghetti. She said, Jared, you just don't understand. Your mind is like a waffle. Compartments. If you want to talk about intimacy, then that's intimacy compartment. If you want to talk about life and work, that's a life and work compartment. And you've got to jump from waffle section to waffle section to be able to understand a conversation. I said, yeah, that makes sense to me. Said, but my mind is connected. Again. I said, I'd like some spaghetti right now. I'm hungry. That's the waffle. Can we put spaghetti on a waffle? I don't know if that would be good or not. It says, likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way. So this has two parts to it that I see here. That we are to have an understanding of our wife. That we've got to get to know the female, the bride. But we need to live a life of understanding. That because we understand who she is, what she's going through, what she's experiencing, how she's processing and living life, we then respond to that. We adjust. There's so many times where I want something done a certain way or I'd like it my way, but as I'm seeing my bride and I see the pain maybe on her face from a long day of chasing three kids around and that her back is hurting, and you know, it's, it's in those moments where I see that I need to be understanding, I need to perceive what's going on, I need to come in the rescue, I need to pick up all three of those kids, I need to take them outside to the park and get them away from her so she can just breathe and rest and relax and have a moment of quiet and clarity. That takes time. That takes practice. That takes intentionality. I don't have this down pat. But scripture says we need to live in a way that is understanding. And when you live in a way that's understanding, you actually live out what Peter is calling you to do here. Showing honor to the woman. You're showing that you love her, that you're elevating her. I'm not a woman, but what I hear from women is that they want to be pursued. They want a knight in shining armor. They don't want that to go away, that when you're married, they'd like the fairy tale to continue. I've got a friend, and he really enjoys the fairy tale. And he got engaged to his bride in a very elaborate way. He decided that he was going to fly her in a helicopter up into the sky and have his friend, his roommate, set lights in the backyard that say, will you marry me? And when they fly over the home, that they would synchronize the lights to turn on and that they would pop up and she would see the lights and read it and see him and say, oh, yes, I'll marry you. And they'll land the helicopter and get in a fancy car and drive away to a nice restaurant and go tell the whole world that they just got married. And, Woo! That's a fairy tale right there. He told me about that plan. I told him, good luck with anniversary number one. <laughs> How are you going to top that? Now, I've just resided the fact that that's not me. But even though I don't have that creative, romantic trying to top that moment inside of me, I still need to show honor to my wife and elevate her in my life in my own way. In my own way, my wife would love to hear, wow, the helicopter ride, the fancy car rental, the dinner, the lights. If you save that money and put it in a 401k, ooh, that would be romantic for my wife. <laughs> you got to learn and do it in different ways. Holding honor to them, lifting them up. And here's the part where some of you are like, okay, you're going to get to this part? You're going to get to this part? Some of you are looking at me, you've been working out, you're like, you're going to get this part? Because I've been lifting weights. And it says here, 
honor the woman as the weaker vessel. This is literally talking about strength. Strength. It's not talking about intellectually, emotionally, or even spiritually. It's talking about physically. Now, I've met some women that could beat me up. There might be some women in here that could beat me up. I mean, that would be a very hard task. I went to a wedding and performed the wedding. I sat down, and these were old baseball friends of mine. And one of my baseball buddies who was a year older than me, he married Holly Holm. And so we sat down at the table, and I was sitting next to Holly Holm. And she is about my size for a female. And uh, I, I want to know Jim, who's not my size. He's about 6'4", probably 240 pounds of solid muscle. I said, Jeff, could you take your wife? Could you beat your wife up? Could you? I'm not saying you should or would you. <laughs> but if things came down to it and she was coming at you, could you take her out? Man, come on. Tell me I'm beat her out, right? And he just laughed at me. <laughs> no way. She would kill me. And she's sitting right there. So I'm thinking, okay, that's a smart move. But I know the promoter of Jackson Jim. I went to high school with him as well. I said, Ricky, come on, give it, give it to me real. Like, you see Jeff, he's a big boy. Could Jeff take Holly in a fight? And he laughed at me too. He said, no way. She would destroy him. Okay? So there are some ladies in this world that could beat up a lot of men. But there's some men like Brock Lesnar out there that could probably take Holly home to task. Now this is not trying in any way to demote or devalue a woman. In fact, we see here that we're supposed to sacrifice, give up our own wants, needs, and desires for women. That we're supposed to honor them. That we likewise have the same rules applied to us of submitting to God and caring for one another. This is just saying, as a man, we were built to be more physically strength. There's in this picture here, the strength. It's this picture of protection. And men, we're to protect our families. Protect them physically. We're to protect them emotionally. We're to protect them spiritually. We've got to look out for the needs of our family. I like the way Matthew Henry spoke about a man and a woman. Talking about the formation of woman, how that she was not taken from his head so he could lord over her with his intelligence. Not taken from his feet so he could trample over her. But she was taken from his side, a rib, under the arm as a sign of protection, close to the heart to be loved and honored. That's the picture here that we get from this verse. Men that we are to protect. We're to honor our spouses. We're to care for them. You don't get to protect or care for your spouse by getting it your way all the time. Some good advice was given to a husband as he was about to get married. And they said, in life, decisions should take two yeses and one no. Think about that in your relationships. You're both on the same page at all times. And if you're not on the same page, the no from the husband or the no from the wife should slow you down. To take time to go through that decision, to spend more time looking at it from different angles, praying together, and then getting to the two yeses. And there's some implications here of when you do this. Verse 7 says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, they're your partners in this. They're side by side with you. So that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, when I look at this, does it seem to imply that if you don't honor, respect, and uphold your wife, and you don't care for them, and that you don't likewise serve them, that your prayers won't be answered? Yes. Yes. And theologically, that's sound as well. Because if you're not living out your life as a husband the way God has called you to, you're walking in disobedience. It's just straight sinful. 
If you're a husband who's demanding, and this is my way, and you're using scripture to try and get your own way, that's not right. That's not what God has called you to do. If you're making life about yourself and you're distancing yourself from your bride and your children, that's not right. That's sinful. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I cherish sin in my heart, he will not hurt me. And the interesting thing about this verse here is the your in the Greek is plural. So here's another picture of how the husband should be leading his family. He should be pr praying together with his family. That the family should have prayers that are unified. That the family should come together and submit themselves to God and ask for God's guidance and leadership. But when you do that, when you submit your life to God, when you honor your spouse, you see God move in ways that only He can get the credit and glory because you're doing it God's way. So this morning, I wonder, do you have a vision for your family, for your life, for your marriage? Are you practicing what God calls you to? Are you spending time submitting yourselves to God, praying, reading scripture, working on your character? Are you asking God to give you understanding? Are you sacrificing? Putting the needs of others above yourself? That's what God has called you to. And by his power and his strength, he can lead you to do it. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we ask that we could be men and women who take 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 very seriously. Because all around us we see the earth-shattering shaking of families taking place. Some of us have experienced the pain and the hurt of a broken relationship. Some of us have experienced firsthand how hard it is to go through that. Some of us here have watched our parents and their relationship dissolve. And Lord, that, that hurts. And God, we don't want that for ourselves. Lord, we don't want to get 20 years down the road in our relationship and look back and see an aimless, zigzag marriage full of selfishness and a lack of sacrifice. So God, we call upon you. We ask you to change us, even right now, to break us. Lord, if we're not living in a way that's anywhere close to what your word is calling us to, Lord, we pray that you'd reveal it to us. And Lord, you'd break us from those habits of selfishness. And God, that you would give us a greater vision for our own lives and our families. Lord, by your strength and your might, we ask that you would do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, we're so glad that you came. And we hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful Labor Day weekend. And we want to invite you back. You know, Anchor Church is a fun, growing church. And if you're looking for ways to connect, uh, we have got some connect cards on our welcome table. We'd love for you to fill one of those cards out. And maybe God's calling you to serve in children's ministry or set up or tear down or help out with the band in some way. Or maybe you've got a personal ministry and vision that God's given you and you want to see him use for his glory and if you want to help the church in some way, fill out that connect card and let us know. If you're a guest, if you fill out one of those cards, the info cards, we'd love to just bless you and say thank you for coming. And we've got a $5 gift card to Starbucks that we want to hand your way. And so we'll be at the welcome table at the end of service. You can fill out the card there, drop it off. And we'd love to give you that as a gift to you just to say thank you for coming to Anchor Church.
Well, you guys have a great, great week, and we'll see you next week.